Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. So all right, today, again, we're, we're continuing down the path of just talking about uh, real-world systems that are implementing the concepts and ideas that, that we've talked about. So before we jump into uh, today's lecture, again, some administrative stuff that I, I posted some of this on uh, Piazza, but I want to put it all in one place uh, now. So the, the final presentations for the project is going to be when we have our scheduled final exam. Uh, I think it's in this room. It's the schedule to start on Thursday morning at 8.30 a.m. That's we're not doing that. Let's start at 9 a.m. Uh, and, and we'll do don uh, uh, or donuts and uh, or bagels. We can decide what we want to do. Um, and then the written final exam, that will be given out the April 24th, which I think is next week, next, next Wednesday. Uh, again, that'll be a, um, it'll be a prompt to ask, ask you, asking you a question about the, the tries to encompass all the ideas that we've talked about throughout the entire semester. So it's not like multiple choice questions like, what does this paper say? What does that paper say? Because that's <laughs> anybody can go you know, figure that stuff out. It's more about synthesizing the ideas, uh, again, that we've, of all the various things we've talked about, and applying it to a new situation, which is again the main thing you want to get away, uh, get out of this, uh, this this course. In addition to all you know development stuff you guys are doing for the project, but like again, how to take all of these ideas and see how they fit into uh, a, a, the bigger picture of some some data processing or data system. Okay. And again, that'll be due when we the same day we have the final exam. You just show up and, and hand it to me. Uh, and then we'll do what we did uh, last year. Uh, you can use ChatGPT to help you answer the question. Uh, but obviously, if you're if you're stupid and copy the prompt or you know copy the the, the output and put it right into the, your response without checking it, you're gonna cause there's gonna be problems. Uh, at least last year when, when we put the question in, it said I invented stuff, which is not true. Uh, I assure you, it's not true. So uh, just be, be mindful of that. Okay. And then we'll also do what we did last year is you can uh, again you won't you're not penalized for this if you use ChatGPT because why wouldn't you? You can it's. It's the way things are going. Uh, but we'll do a, William will set up a, a, um, a Google form that I can't see, and you just tell us whether you use ChatGPT or not, and then I'll try to predict whether you did or not. Okay? <laughs> well, that's fun. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Uh, so, do you know what SCP is? You ever heard of SCP programming language? Okay. All right. Just, just checking. All right, I'll explain afterwards. Um, all right, so again, last class we were talking about Databricks Photon. Again, that wasn't a full-fledged system. That was a an extension library that you would add that they that the Databricks people added into Spark. That the the Java code running Spark SQL would then invoke through JNI, and that was a C plus C plus uh, vectorized engine that would try to offload the computation expensive tasks. In, when you're running a query in Spark SQL and push that down to C++. And they showed pretty significant performance gains. So today, again, when we talk about Snowflake, and, um, and we'll see this also in Redshift, you know, these are going to be you know, full-fledged systems that are going to look and smell a lot like uh, Dremel and other systems we've talked about throughout the entire semester, and, and Yellow Brick as well. All right, so just like before, uh, before we jump into Snowflake, uh, it's important to sort of, again, to take a step back and understand what the what the sort of the landscape and the database world looked like at the time that Snowflake came, came on the scene. Um, and a lot of this is repeating the things that we've talked about throughout the entire semester. Um, so again, the, in the 2000s, that's when we saw the, these, these special purpose or specialized OLAP systems that were built just to run OLAP, kind of OLAP queries we talked about in the entire semester, that they sort of came on the scene. Uh, and for the most part, a lot of them were pushing this idea of, of a column store uh, it's a little before, I mean, VectorWise came along in the later 2010s, but, you know, everyone's sort of operating column stores, compressed data, and then VectorWise showed how to do vectorized uh, processing on these things. So of all these, Vertica and Greenplum are probably the, the two biggest ones. Um, MonadD we've talked about, and we'll talk about this again about DuckDB. Like DuckDB, the, the early version of DuckDB was MonadDB Lite, which is a fork of this system, and we talked a little bit about that. Vector-wise, we covered in the early semester. Par Excel, we'll see again when we talk about Redshift, because Redshift wasn't written from scratch by Amazon. They bought a license to the Par, the par Excel source code. Uh, and we'll see the transition that going from a shared nothing system that Par, par Excel was into, uh, into what Redshift is today. So of all of these, except for Vector-wise and MoneyDB, 
These are all forks of, of Postgres. Uh, and they've ripped out the, you know, the, the storage layer and rewrote a lot of stuff to, to make it you know, operate on uh, analytical workloads. And at the same time while this was all going on, Hadoop became popular. Every, everybody was trying to sho shove a lot of data on HDFS. Again, it's data lakes before data lakes, uh, before uh, that term came, came to prominence. Right? Hive, we talked about Presto, Impala, and Stinger. So actually, Stinger, we didn't talk about. It's basically the same thing as Impala, or actually, same thing as Hive. It's SQL on top of, uh, of MapReduce and Hadoop. So all of these systems at the time, right, in their various forms, they're supporting analytical systems, but their primary uh, uh, distribution model, like the, the company, the vendor selling the database system, the primary way they, the, that you got access to these various database systems was by downloading it and running it on-prem. So meaning you would buy a license to the source code, or sorry, buy a license to, to the, the database system, but then you would provision the hardware and you would be responsible for, for running it on your local machines, right? And this is you know, pretty much how you ran database systems for, for decades prior to this. So as we talked about last, uh, last week, the Dremel paper comes out in 2011 uh, and shows that, okay, like, you, know, you can build something in, in a cloud sort of native environment to run on a bunch of files that are sitting on these object stores. Right? It's no longer native, uh, natively, the storage is no longer natively managed by the database system. Facebook also starts building Presto in 2012. Uh, again, part of Excel, as we said, this will, we'll discuss this next week when we talk about Redshift, but AWS buys a license to Excel in 2011 and then releases it in, two in 2013 as, as Redshift. And they actually beat Snowflake to the market uh, by a couple months. Uh, whereas, but Snowflake, Snowflake was written from scratch uh, and, and Redshift was, again, was, was based on Excel. Park, I mean, we'll, I'll cover this next week. Excel was basically going bankrupt and they were hoping that Amazon was going to acquire them. Amazon has acquired the source of the license. And I forget who, I think Actian bought uh, and buying Park Cell. So it's still around, but like it's basically a zombie database. So around this same time, uh, there's a VC firm out of, uh, out of, out of uh, Silicon Valley called Sutter Hill, um, where they, they decided that, hey, we're going to build a new cloud native database you know, startup. Um, so they got these two guys that were uh, uh, you know, very prominent engineers at Oracle. And then the Vectorwise uh, uh, developer uh, from the paper you guys read, Marzen Sikowski, from you know, Vectorwise is going under at the time. So they got him. They just combined these three together, gave them a ton of money, and said, go build, you know, go build a cloud data, cloud data warehouse. You know, we'll call it Snowflake. Sutter Hill is different than most of the VC firms you've probably been familiar with, like the Andreessen Horowitz, the Kleiner Perkins, Greylock, and so forth. Right? That, their models is, are like, I have an idea. And you go to them, you pitch them, and say, hey, give me money to go build a startup. The Sutter Hill is basically like putting together a boy band at a record label. You say, let's get some good looking people together, get them in a room, we'll give them money, and then they put out the albums, right? So they're, they're dictating what we sh should build. So that, that's how Snowflake sort of came about. Um, and so again, obviously, Snowflake was super successful because here we are talking about it uh, you know, 12, 12 years later. Um, so again, all these guys are super nice. So, uh, Marcin is. Um, He's much younger than, than these two French guys here. But this just show you how hardcore they are about databases, probably just, just as hardcore as I am. So this is actually Marcin's leg. Uh, he has a snowflake tattoo after they went IPO, right? That's, that's dedication to databases. I, I haven't even gone that far. <laughs> All right, so what is Snowflake? S snowflake is going to be a managed OLAP database system written in C++ that is only going to run on, in the cloud. And again, like this seems obvious today. But back then, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, this was, this was sort of unheard of for, for, for database systems, right? And certainly, you know, the, the Snowflake guys have told me they got a lot of pressure in the early days. Like, hey, we, great system. You know, can we download it and run it, run it on-prem? We don't want to run in the cloud. And they, they said no. Uh, and then eventually everyone just, you know, moved to the cloud. And that's where, you know, if you're a new database startup today and you don't have a cloud, uh, you know, a cloud offering with some exceptions like DuckDB, uh, then, Although we'll see Mother Duck next class as well, like it doesn't, you know, it's very hard to gain, gain traction, right? So everything's everything's being written from scratch, uh, and the paper guys talk about like they, they are, you know, they considered like, oh, should we go take things from like Hadoop or go take, take take things from Postgres, like other systems have done, and they decided that in order to have complete control of everything, uh, they wanted to write everything from scratch. They're going to be doing a shared disk architecture, as we talked about before. Uh, and then one thing that's going to be different than we saw in Dremel, and I think Sp the Photon paper doesn't really talk about this, but Spark SQL doesn't really do this, um, is that they're going to do aggressive compute-side caching on the worker nodes themselves. 
right? So they, since, again, they're not the cloud vendor, it costs them real money to go get things from S3, uh, which is obviously also very slow as well. They want to do as much caching as they can on their side, on nodes that they're, they're already paying for to avoid those, those lookups to, to S3, right? Uh, the, the other interesting thing is that the, rather than doing what most people do today, like taking the, the Postgres SQL di dialect, the grammar file, and using that as the basis to start your, you know, as, as, you know what kind of SQL you're, you're going to support, they wrote everything from scratch. And it kind of looks, if you ever look at the documentation of Snowflake, it kind of looks a little oracle-y, oracle a little enterprise-y, right? And again, I think that's, that's, that's sort of the lineage of, of coming from, um, you know, from the, the, the two French guys coming from Oracle. So I just, I always have to say this, obviously there's not any impropriety, but Snowflake actually sponsored this class in 721 before they went IPO. A lot of my best students uh, went there and still, still work there. Um, so like Ashish stood literally here and presented, uh, you know, presented the, the Snowflake architecture back in the day. Um, so if you want, you can go watch the guest lecture from, from back then. Um, and last year when I was putting this, this, uh, this lecture together, I had a bunch of questions like, because it, you know, it's a closed source system, you can't always infer exactly what they're doing based on the, the blogs and the documentation. Uh, so I actually had a phone call with the Siege. This is Sunday night, before, the day before the lecture, while he was like cooking in his kitchen, he's answering all my Snowflake questions. So the combination of what I'll be talking about today is from the documentation, the paper you guys read, there's another paper as well, and some blog articles, and then well, they're just asking Ashish while he's cooking spaghetti, uh, what does Snowflake do? Um, he's a good dude. Okay, so again, here's that high level uh, bullet points of all everything that we care about in Snowflake that you know, related to other systems. Right, again, not surprising, shared disk, disk aggregated storage. Again, they were the, one of the first systems uh, to, to, to commercialize this and, and, and pursue this. But again, that's, that's building off what Dremel had done, building off of what, um, uh, you know, what, what HDFS and Hadoop were doing at the time. They're gonna do push-based vectorized query processing, uh, relying on uh, pre-compiled primitives, similar to VectorWise and X100. Again, not surprising, Marcin was the guy who built VectorWise um, they're not going to do any cogen except for uh, for serializing and deserializing the movement of data from one worker to another. They're using LLM for this. So it's very limited. Thing like, I have some some data I need to to serialize to a binary format, ship that over the wire, and send it to another node. Again, this is like 2013, 2014. This is before Apache Arrow. So to make this work fast, they would they would have this little cogen piece that could that you could compile it to send data over. I mean, sim sim somewhat similar to like what protobuf would, would actually do for you as well. Uh, they're going to make they're going to separate the table data from the me the metadata, and we'll talk a little bit about this because that opens up some opportunities for other optimizations, um, and it's certainly different than. Oh, well, I mean now it's sort of commonplace because you run something like Hive Catalog or whatever, or Databricks has their unique catalog, uh, but this is certainly different from a single node system. There's not going to be an explicit buffer pool in every single node. Uh, they basically have LRU cache aside when things move things in and out, but nothing really, uh, nothing fancy. Like everyone else, they're gonna use PAX, uh, columnar storage, because again, they started before like Parquet and Orc were like a, a like a big thing that that they are now. They're gonna have their own proprietary storage format that they'll have for for managed data. But now, since the last five year, years or so, they're they're supporting all the the open source file formats that we'd expect. I think they can do sort merge join, but primarily most of the time they're going to pick hash join, as we talked about, was always going to be better. And then they have a cascade style query optimizer that again tries to leverage the adaptive optimizations that we talked about before. So we're going to mostly focus on, on these things, but I'll sprinkle in discussions as we go along for, for the other topics. So the first thing is what does the architecture look like? So they are, obviously, again, they're going to run on uh, disaggregated storage. So this is just using an object store. Uh, to leverage that. And again, the paper talks about how they, they made this decision early on when, when designing Snowflake. Should they actually spend time building the storage layer or should they just uh, give up control and let, you know, just use S3 and let Amazon uh, handle that for them? And part of that decision was, you know, it's from an engineering effort. So you can only do so many things when you first start building a new system. They decided they would rather focus on uh, the, you know, the execution engine and leverage client-side caching, or sorry, worker-side caching, or compute-side caching to, to speed things up and just, you know, just let Amazon handle all the, you know, the, the, the replication and storage uh, durability guarantees you would need. Um, 
So I think that turned out to be a, a smart choice. I think originally version the, the original version they only supported S3, and now they support all the other major cl cloud vendors for their storage. So they're going to have this notion of uh, yes. His question, his statement is, uh, if you're running on Amazon, Amazon has a competing product. Yeah. Like, are, are you, would, would, should you be afraid of Amazon, like, trying to, like, do something to screw you over? Definitely, yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's a big company that's something. But, I mean, Snowflake's a big company, too, right? Yeah, like, they have a lot of business from Snowflake, right? Yeah, they make a, so, um, how do I say this? Think about, from a publicity standpoint, how terrible that would be for Amazon, be like, Hey, we just like screwed over our biggest competitor, one of our biggest competitors. Um, then, like that would immediately panic all the other companies that are, you know, relying heavily on Amazon and make them go go elsewhere. From a business, so from a business standpoint, like a short-term gain, short-term benefit, for, but for long-term, you know, problems, it's just not worth it. Now, there are some companies we've talked to, at least in the startup, where like they should have tell us we don't run on Amazon because you know we can see, consider them a competitor, and so they they have to run on GCP or something else. Uh, but again, Amazon's not stupid. They're not going to let, you know, they, they, I don't think they would, I like to think they would not make decisions like that. Now, so I will say, though, the way Amazon's going to get around this, so even though they may not make, um, you know, they, they may not make S3 slower because they recognize it's a snowflake query or something, that would be terrible, right, and not scalable. Though they can do other things like, not so much for, uh, well, actually, for Redshift, we'll see this. They can add hardware accelerators and other things above S3, right, that's running on the same data center that, you know, maybe Snowflake can't easily do to accelerate certain things. And they do this for Aurora as well, right? They, they push down, they have a layer above EBS that does transactional, uh, pr transaction up propagations to replicas for, you know, Postgres and MySQL that you just can't get if, you run it, if you're external to Amazon. So there's other optimizations you can do. Yes. Is that something, are you referring to like internally they were using S3 to store all, just for all their managed storage and then they switched over to a mix of the three or are you saying something more like they added support for Apache Iceberg and now you can use any of these? This question is like when I say they added support for like say Google Cloud Storage or Azure, does that mean that like, like if you're a new customer you show up and you start storing data into Snowflake that that'll spread it across the different data centers? No, I, I think you tell them when you sign up, like, I want to run on AWS, I want to run on this, right? But it's still managed through them. So uh, what do you mean, who, who's, sorry, who's them? Snowflake. So it's Snowflake's managed storage. Yes. So you're just saying, like, use this other one, but it's, so why would you ever choose to use one or the other? Uh, like, why would you choose the other cloud vendors? Yeah. I mean, there's companies that, like, we've talked to, like, a, they were a Canadian uh, grocery store. They're like, we see Amazon as a competitor. We don't run on Amazon. We, we run on Google. Right? People have various reasons. But you can't like integrate it with existing data on an object store because it's being managed, right? No, we'll get to that in a second. They, in the, like, we're, we're leading up to it. Like, the original version of, of Snowflake was like, okay, we're going to store, thing, store things on S3, but the, the data we're storing actually inside the buckets in S3 is our proprietary data format. Because at the time, that's how everyone built these data warehouses. Now, Dremel was doing its own thing, right? Uh, but, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't until like Parquet and other things came along that like people, people realized, oh yeah, like I can have my disparate system generate a bunch of these files and I want to be able to scan it with my database system. That precipitated them having to support external tables or other things to, to be able to read data from, from S3 that, are, you know, that, that wasn't ingested through the front of the data system. Redshift's going to go through the same tr transformation as well. So question, the question is, at this point, why does Snowflake not build their own S3? Availability? Above my pay grade, I don't know. Right, like. I mean, that'd be really hard. Yeah, the availability and the durability. Yeah, like, you'd have to start building data centers. It cost them a lot of money there. It'd be expensive. So what benefit? And like, they can make I mean, they're not stupid. I guarantee they, they did the back of the envelope calculations. It's like, 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 does this actually make sense or not, right? I think next, Netflix did something similar. They realized that like, I think they were running on-prem, and then they, they, went, they switched to the data centers. Like, the big companies always try to figure out, is it cheaper to do this? But think of it. If you're like Snowflake, Snowflake is a huge company, right? But it's not as big as Amazon. 
And how many data centers is, is Snowflake building? One a year, maybe, I don't know. Amazon's probably spinning up a new one like every, every few months, right? So at economies of scale, they can just do way more efficiently than anyone else. So the interim data between the two uh, virtual warehouses, is that being sent to, uh, I know there's no in-memory in -memory shuffle. Is the reason for that, that they don't have control over, like they, don't, they can't have the, the hardware accelerators, and so they decided, hey, they're all easy to do incident instances, might as well keep it in memory and just share data between them? Your question is, I mean, we haven't got there yet. Your question is, why are they going to allow worker nodes to talk to each other rather than going through the shuffle phase? Yeah. Um, I, 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 I I think it's just from a, from a, it's just a philosophical decision of like, that's how they want to build it, okay. right? It's, there's, there's pros and cons of both of them, okay. right? And actually, this is a good discussion. We can have this now. Like, you know, the shuffle phase, it's nice because here's this abstraction layer that I can just write things to. It, you know, it'll have some fault tolerant guarantees that they're not going to be able to do, right. right? So there's that. But now there's a whole other service I got to run with additional nodes, and it's actually now making another copies of, of data, right? So there's pros and cons to all, there's no free lunch. Uh, as far as I know, like, uh, obviously it's not like only runs on the cloud, right? But there's companies out there that actually also want maybe have some database on-prem or maybe move workloads between the cloud and on-prem. Is there a big market still for that or is it just everybody just clouds it? I mean, this is not exactly the sort of like architecture. His question is like, is there still a big market for people running on-prem databases? Yes. Uh, but like, the, the sales cycles for those things are just way different. Because you gotta like, you know, go out and have like, you know, go fly out there, talk, talk to the customer, like, you know, take them out to dinner and that kind of crap, go golfing, you know, like <laughs> things in the 80s. Um, whereas like Snowflake and, and the, the Davis Service model, like, hey, here's our website, just give your credit card and you're up and running, right? So again, like that, for, for small startups, sure, you can do that, but like, yeah, obviously no banks can be like, all right, just here's the credit card, just do it. Um, yeah, no, there is, there is a huge market, I think that, um, I mean, just there's everybody. I think the, the market of people going to the cloud is that, that percentage, that pie is growing at a much larger rate than people spinning up stuff on-prem. Uh, again, it's not just from terms of, like, don't think of this like the cost of like, oh, if I ran it on-prem, I certainly can run it cheaper than what Amazon would charge me for machines or, right? But then, like, then you got to pay for humans to go actually m and manage those things. So there's like pros and cons of all of these. All right. Um, okay. So uh, right. So the so the abstraction they're gonna have they have data storage. They're gonna have this notion of a virtual warehouse. Uh, again, this is how they, they they first designed it, where you 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 basically say I want to. You don't say exact number of nodes. Say I want sort of this compute capacity. You say here's some virtual data warehouse that that I can. Have, give me an endpoint where I can start sending data into and run, and run queries on, right? Um, they then, and so w when you turn on a virtual data warehouse, whether or not you're running queries, you're always paying for it, right? And we'll see how Snowflake will leverage that when they do the flexible compute, because they, they can steal idle cycles from, from, from these warehouses. In 2022, they added support for serverless deployments. So now basically the virtual data warehouse spins itself down if you're not running any, any queries, but obviously they charge a premium for that. Because now you're using more shared infrastructure at the, uh, the cloud services layer instead of spinning that up yourself. And then the cloud services layer is just the, the catch-all phrase for the front end of, of the system that encompasses all the things that we've been talking about the entire semester. Some coordinator, scheduler, the catalog, the query optimizer, right? all that is, is, is the entry point for, for queries. And we'll see at the end of the semester, or sorry, in, in the class, the catalog is interesting because they're going to be built on another data system called FoundationDB. Um, that provides them transactional semantics for, for doing updates. All right, so now within a, at the compute layer, they have a notion between a worker node and, and a worker process. And again, this is from 2012, 2013, so uh, a worker node, at least in the original version, is just an EC2 instance, right? This is before Docker, this is before Kubernetes. Uh, like Docker is 2012, Kubernetes is 2014, but in 2012, you know, you just you had raw EC2 instances, and so on that instance, this is where they're going to maintain the local uh, this local cache on the attached storage device of, of of that instance. So they're not reading right into EBS; it's always running on on a, on a local, well now be a local SSD, right? Um, and this cache is going to be a combination of intermediate results 
uh, that, that you're generating for, for a query while it's running, as well as some of the persistent files that you may be retrieving from S3. So the idea is that if another query shows up, reads the same data that you just read from S3, I can read it from my local cache, which is going to be faster and cheaper than having to go do a round trip lookup on, on over, to, over S3 or whatever the object store is. right? Again, we'll see this in a second. The way they're going to manage this, keep this everything consistent, or keep spread data out evenly, and be able to scale up and scale down uh, without having to reshuffle everything as you would in a shared nothing architecture, is that they're going to rely on consistent hashing to keep track of what, what worker node is responsible for what persistent data on, uh, in, in, in their own cache. And then within the worker node, when a query shows up, they'll, they'll fire off a whole new worker process, right? Again, literally like a, you know, a, a spawn of a new process in the OS. And that's going to be executing whatever the, the tasks are for, the, for this query. And it can read and write data to the animated results and other workers uh, or, at, or out the S3. And then when the query is done, the, the process ends and goes away. Yes? It's like a tangential question, but you can have an EBS volume at the root, as the root device, right? So is that not like a local, locally connected? Like His question is, the, like on EC2, you can have an EBS volume mounted as the root device. Yes, you have to anyway, because you have to have, it, it, like the AMI image has to spin up. But you still can have a locally attached SSD that you can then use NVMe to or whatever to, 2012 before that, but like that you can then read and write locally. That's just another mount in the file system. And that's going to be way faster than EBS. Okay. Actually, so I don't, I don't know whether they've switched over to Kubernetes now. Uh, we'll see in, when we talk about Yellow Brick, the paper, they're all in on Kubernetes and they, they make a big deal about how they're designed to run in the, the, in the sort of the, the, the Kubernetes uh, you know, infrastructure. I assume now they're not dumb, that they're, they're doing something uh, very similar these days, whether it's exactly Kubernetes or something else. Um, it, you know, it doesn't matter. All right, so when a query actually starts running, they're going to be doing a push-based vectorized execution, again, using the pre-compiled primitives with templated C++ based on the different data types that, that we've talked about. We've already mentioned that they only, they're only doing cogen for when they serialize and deserialize data going from one worker node to another. Um, and as he mentioned, they're not going to do explicit shuffle between stages. And instead, the worker processes are going to be allowed to send data directly to, push the data directly to the, no, to the next node who's going to process it or they keep it locally and keep processing it if, if they're going up the pipeline as further, uh, as needed, right? So that means now when, if, if the worker node is, ha, has all the, the intimate results, if it crashes or there's a failure, there now isn't a, there isn't, it's not replicated or it's not being uh, stored as, as an external service uh, from the worker node. So that means the, the computation is lost. And unlike in Dremel and Spark, where if one worker goes down, then the coordinator then just invokes a new one or hands off that task to another worker, what Snowflake would do is just kill the entire query and then restart it from, from the beginning. And that's actually how the people built OLAP systems back in the day. I mentioned this before. In, with MapReduce, they were, uh, you know, they were storing things um, on disk as they went along, but they had the ability to you know, kill, kill tasks re-execute things uh, and do uh, basically partial, partial retry. In, in the Snowflake world, they're not going to add any of that infrastructure because that's additional engineering complexity. They're just going to make the decision, OK, well, one worker failed. OK, just kill the whole thing and restart. And who pays for the restart? The customer, right? So obviously, you know, they're not killing nodes randomly, right? Uh, they have a blog article where they discuss, like, OK, like, if a, if a worker dies, they have to identify, is this something that we did, or is this a transit network failure, right? In some cases, they can actually uh, automatically roll you back to a previous version of Snowflake uh, and rerun that query, rerun the query, see whether that sol solves the problem. Um, the tricky thing also, too, is like if now you're ingesting new data, you want to make sure that the query, when it reruns, like is it, is it seeing the same data that it had before? Question? Or? His question is, how often do queries fail? I mean, not that often, right? I, I actually, I, they have a blog article I should link. Um, I don't, I don't know the exact number, but it's not like, you know, one out of ten. It's some, 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 uh, some way smaller fraction. Again, because it's like you're not running. Again, just going back to the MapReduce world, like Hadoop was talking about. Okay, we're going to run this this query 
or the, the MapReduce job on thousands of, of like cheap pizza box machines, like the one, one unit rack machines. And in that environment, yeah, if one of them is going to go down, if a query is going to run for an hour, it's, it, certainly one's going to go down. But like not only are these queries running so fast, um, you know, it, they're running on a small number of machines anyway. So the likelihood of a failure is, is quite low. Yes? But doesn't that come with scalability issues then? Doesn't come with scalability mean, in terms of what? Uh, in terms of like you can't expect to notice. Yeah, so the so question is like, his statement is like, statement is like, okay, if, if, they're, if, if I'm saying like the more machines you have, the more likely one's going to fail, does that have some upper bound how many machines you would need? Again, it's so fast that I don't think you need thousands of machines to process petabytes of data. Oh, so the problem with Hadoop was Hadoop was so slow. The Hadoop was so slow that, like, because, right? Because uh, it wasn't any query optimizer and it was just doing this, this dumb map reduce shuffle, map shuffle thing over and over again, no matter what the query actually was doing. It had no notion of like pipelines unless someone wrote everything inside of you know, the single map job. Uh, Again, I, I think it's, whereas like at the time, other parallel data systems like the, the, the verticals of the world, are, you know, they were running on, uh, they need fewer nodes to compute the same, amount of, you know, the same results in, in less time. So one thing Snowflake does do, uh, even though they're on the shovel phase, they can do work stealing. Um, and it's similar to the morsel stuff that we, we saw before, where instead of a coordinator like in Dremel, recognizing that this guy's running slow, this task is running slow, let me kill him and let it fire up the task somewhere else. The workers themselves, the worker, know, the worker processes, excuse me, they're looking for work to do. And so they recognize that for all the input files they were told at the beginning of here, you need a process for this stage of the query plan. If it runs out of stuff to do, then they can go do uh, quick lookups on other workers running the same, at the same stage as they are and see whether they're falling behind and go steal files from them. But and avoid, to avoid burdening the, the other worker nodes with sending the data from, 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 you know, from, from their locally cached data to the guy that's going to do, do the, steal the task from them, they always go out to S3 because the idea is that if the, the node is already running, beh running behind because it's slow for some reason, if now another node says, OK, yeah, you're running too slow, give me, give me the data that you have, that's just going to make it even slower, make things worse. So they make the conscientious decision that they're just going to go out to S3, even though they pay for it, even though they have a local cache version, they'll go out to S3 because that avoids uh, slowing things down even further. And then when you, this, this, the stealing worker goes, gets the data from S3, it can put intermediate results in, in its local storage, just like before, but it's not going to maintain the, the persistent files in its cache uh, beyond the, the, you know, the, the worker just stole because Again, there's some higher level organization through this consistent hashing that's deciding what worker node is responsible for what file on, on S3. So you know, the next time the query runs and it reads the same data, it wouldn't go to this, the, that node anyway. It would go back to the, the original one. Yes? Uh, so you said that the intermediate results are stored on the local disk, right? So how can you get from S3 on, unless you send it to S3, right? So say, say it again, the what? So when you're work stealing from another node, yes. Uh, statement is like if, if you're if it's processing data from it's an, it's not processing like the original persistent files instead it's it's reading from uh, it's reading from the intermediate results how can you go to S3 and get it because you you could go to the other the worker node that it got it from right and, and retrieve the data so then you will just have to start from the beginning you want no, no 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 so like so like the if the worker node got if the, you know worker node and I'm slides here or diagrams. If worker node X is running behind, but it got its data from worker node Y. Now worker node Z is going to steal that data. It can go to worker node Y and get those intermediate results. Or if it's, if it's, again, if it's reading persistent files, it would go to S3. I think the worker nodes can also spill to S3 as well. Like if, if you just run out of space entirely, then the last case, let, you know, the, the, the fallback is to store things in S3 as well. His question is, how can a worker know the progress of another worker and identify that they're running behind? I, I don't know whether they talk to the coordinator or they talk to the other you know, worker, right? But like, it, I, I don't, it's not broadcast, because like, there'll be, a, there'll be like a heartbeat that, that, 
that, that's, that broadcast every so often is say, hey, look, I'm still alive. But he wouldn't say, like, here's my progress as I'm going along. So it's, it's either the coordinator or the, the worker who say, you know, give, give me something to do. Okay, so, okay, so, so Snowflake is going to do work stealing. And again, what I like about this paper is like they, they describe, like, here's why we did it this way. Uh, and they go a bit more details than, than Dremel and, and uh, Databricks do. The other interesting thing they can support as well is they, what they call flexible compute. And the idea here is that because the, the, you know, the original model of Snowflake was like you, you define this virtual data warehouse that sort of sets up the number of compute nodes you're going to have um, at the beginning. And that those, unless you're using serverless, those, those, those machines are always running. So maybe the case that for any, some query shows up, you're actually under-provisioned. You don't have as much uh, compute capacity you actually need to run the query in a, in a timely manner. So what they'll do is they'll recognize prior to running, they'll look at the query plan and identify, is there any part where I think the query plan, this, this portion of the query plan is going to take a longer time than, than I, I would want? And can I then uh, hand off those, the tasks for that part of the query plan to other nodes that I actually, the customer is actually not paying for? Basically, think of like other, other idle customers that, that have compute nodes that aren't using. If I can farm out part of the query plan to those other nodes, it's a win-win situation for everyone because the query runs faster. Snowflake is not spending any more money because the customer is already paying for the, the EC2 instance anyway. And the, the, the customer that you're borrowing the machines from, they don't even know that their machines are being used in this way and that when they run queries, they can leverage the same uh, spare capacity as well. So let's say again, so you say we have on this side of the query plan here, uh, on the probe side of this join, it wants to do some large scan. So Snowflake can then split this up into two, two uh, sort of subplans that are going to be combined together with the union all. And so here we have the, the, the portion of the query uh, that's going to run on, the, on the, the customers, the customer to initiate the query on their data warehouse, their, their compute nodes. But this, this piece over here, this is going to run on, on the spare hardware. Again, idle machines running in, you know, running in, running in the Snowflake uh, you know, ecosystem. So, but because these machines aren't controlled by the, the customer that's invoking the query, you can't write any intermediate results to the local disk because at any moment, the, the, customer could sh the, the customer who owns these machines could start running a query, and you've got to evict all this right away. Because right? it doesn't look good if, like, hey, you, know, you submit a query. Uh, give, me, give me 20 seconds. I've got to finish up you know, Joe's, Joe's query. Because right? people get pissed, right? So what they'll do is, instead of writing the data to the local storage, they'll instead s insert it as if it was a table back into S3. And then now, when I, when I, when I retrieve it again, uh, you know, it, 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 the, the, the query operator above it is just reading from S3 like it, like it was a regular table. All right? Actually, going back here, this is actually... This is actually from Snowflake. So this is another example of the sideway information passion stuff we talked about before. So they have this, you build a hash join, uh, sorry, you build a hash table to do the join, and they have this operator called a join filter. That's passing over the bloom filter from, from the build side to the probe side, right? They, just, they explicitly call it out as a separate operator called join filter. Right, again, so, so this is just, because it's a managed service and not running on-prem, Right? There's elasticity to the, the resources that are available. And again, they smartly recognize, OK, these machines are idle uh, right now. Let me use them to make queries run faster. And this is all, again, all transparent to, to the customer. You can also use this for, the, for basically, basically query result caching. Almost like, not exactly like a materialized view, because it's not going to automatically refresh. But you, since you're, you're writing out the, the output of this query plan fragment, into S3, you can then update the catalog and say, OK, if we ever see this query plan fragment again on, on these, these files, here's some materialized result for it that you can then reuse. Yes? Wouldn't that be concerning for customers? Like, typically, customers don't want their data anywhere near the data of another customer, right? I mean, that's the whole idea of like, the statement is, isn't this, um, wouldn't this be concerning for customers? Because they don't want their data to be mixed with any other data. Well, one is they have, they have sort of compute isolation because, as I said before, the worker process kill, gets killed after the query. So it's not like whatever you're running, you know, your whatever task you run for this query 
wakes up and can now start seeing the, the next customer's data, right? It's a managed service, so it's not running arbitrary code. It's all Snowflake code. So if you're trusting Snowflake with your data anyway, you could trust them to write the, the compute side of things. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's not. It's not that big of a secret. And again, to, to your original point, I, I don't think it's not. Like, I don't think it's a real concern, right? And if you really, I think you can opt out of this and say like, I want to run in a. In a, in a right. This is not. This is not. I. This is not controversial. It's running Snowflake code. It should be yeah, it's running Snowflake code. You should be. You, no one. Yeah. There's, there's other. There's other things to be worried about. And again, it's like. It's like. It's like the, the, the give a penny, take a penny thing, right? So like, right now my, my data warehouse is idle, so yeah, if you, someone else can take advantage of it, sure. But then when, you know, when I need it, then you know, I can leverage somebody else's. And it, it all works out. Yes? This is not unique to Snowflake, right? Other, other systems will do this? Like, this question, this is not unique to Snowflake. It's not even just like DBMS systems. Like, I don't know. Uh, it's I question, I mean, so so there was a there was a system out of the '80s that actually I worked on. It was called my pre-doc. This thing called Condor, and it was it was called the Cycle Scavenger. It's basically if you had a bunch of machines in your computer science department, at night it would recognize that no one's touched the keyboard and, or the mouse, and then it would start running you know compute heavy jobs on the machines. And then when you you came back the next morning, when, when you started using the mouse, there was a little small pause while it evicted the jobs, but then like you know you got additional resources. So the the, the that idea of like Cycle scavenging is not new. Specific for databases, again, I think what's different about this is because it's in the cloud, it's a single giant pool of all this compute capacity, right, that, that Snowflake has, has under its control that you can do this. Amazon does, does it differently, right? Amazon has spare EC2 resources. They try to sell them off as, as uh, spot instances at a low price. But of course, anytime you could get evicted because somebody else wants to pay a higher price. Um, in terms of databases that doing something similar, um, uh, I'll have to cut this, right? Not exactly the same, but like, yeah, taking advantage of idle resources is a known thing. Or Carl, also too, like think of the database system, like you know, maybe not so much for the OLAPs. Actually, you know, we'll see some micropartitions. Like there's all background jobs you want to run anyway, and you do this when you have downtime. Right, so it's the idea is not far fetched because again, because they're in a cloud, this opens up opportunities that you would not be able to get uh, easily otherwise. Okay, so as I said before, the they're going to rely on some object store, typically originally S three, um, but of course, you know, there's downsides to this because it's going to be slower. You have to go make requests over, you know. You can't do kernel bypass. You got to go over the network, make an HTTPS call call to their API. That's got to get encrypted and, and decrypted when it comes back. Right? That's expensive. We'll see next week. We talk about Yellow Brick that they're super hardcore about this, and they wrote their own S3 drivers that use kernel bypass to, to go as fast as possible. Talking S3. I don't know whether Snowflake does it, does something similar, but you can imagine they have a lot of money that they could. So instead, what they're going to do uh, in Snowflake is that instead of having to build their own uh, again, in their, their own object store, their own storage layer, they're just going to build their own cache layer, caching layer on the worker nodes uh, and make that as fast as possible. Because now the benefit is if they, if they do a really good job caching, they end up paying less money to Amazon because they're making fewer requests to S3, but it also makes the queries run faster because now you're, you're not going to S3. So it's like a win-win situation for everyone, uh, except maybe Amazon, but like they have enough money. Like, you know, so. I think this was a smart engineering t decision for them to do. Wait, so it's, it's a separate layer of nodes that just act as a cache? No, the, the, the question is, is it a separate layer of nodes that acts as a cache? No, the worker nodes themselves okay. have each have a, have a local cache, right? And then if that cache fills, they can then spill to S3, if, if it's like an e result, right? And then they're going to prioritize, this paper talks about it, I don't think the paper you guys read talks about it, they're going to prioritize the persistent files uh, sorry, they're going to prioritize the intimate results, uh, keeping that local versus going out to, uh, versus main, main t uh, maintaining the persistent files. Because the intimate results are ephemeral. You want to be able to get them out really quickly and make the, make the equation run faster. Uh, 
And so you want to use as much as your local storage and in in your local cache for those in results. And they're not doing anything fancy. They just talk about how they're using this LRU to do cache from placement policy. And that's good enough for, for the work, their environment. Yes? So it's not like, a, let's say, traditional buffer pool manager, but like it's, it's still like sort of a buffer pool manager, but instead of like local disk, it's S3. His question, so statement is like, it's, is it, it's not like a pure, not a traditional buffer pool manager where it's two layers, either in memory or on disk. It's multi layered, yes. It's either in memory, on disk, or S3. And I think they talk about, at least in this paper, in 2020, this is before um, there was this sort of persistent memory work or devices that, that Intel was putting out, and that was sort of seen as, a, as another layer. Like you had, you, had, you had DRAM memory, then you would have persistent memory, like Optane, then you had the SSD, then you would have and then the S3. Intel cut off the Optane, so that's not a thing anymore. But they, they, they talk about how like, you know, having sort of a holistic view of a multi-level cache uh, is something that they're, they're thinking about doing. OK, so again, the original version of, of Snowflake, or I guess by default, when you put, when you put data in Snowflake, they're going to be using their own proprietary storage format. Um, and again, this is before Parquet, before Orc. But at a high level, it's, it's going to look, I've had students tell me that it looks basically equivalent to Parquet and Orc. Um, right? It's using PACs, it's columnar storage, uh, you know, it's doing dictionary encoding. I think they're doing run length encoding, right? So that, there's, there's nothing dramatically different or special about what they're doing there other than it's proprietary to them. Like you can't, you, they're not going to give you like a binary file in the format because they wouldn't have, there's no readers externally for these things. But then one thing they're going to do is gonna, for any data that shows up, they're going to break it up into what they call micro partitions. And I think this is roughly like a, uh, almost equivalent to like a row group that, that we talked about in, in Parquet. And so the original data for micro partition range up to 50 to 500 megs. But after doing all the compression stuff, including, I, I think they run like a, a block-based compression, like Snappy or LZ standard, they'll get each, each micro partition down to 16 megabytes. Then in the background, uh, they're, going to, uh, they're going to periodically check to see whether the, 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 the clustering of these, these micro partitions is actually ideal. And they can reor reorganize them and, and resort them uh, based on how the, what join key people are using or what, what access key people, people are using uh, for queries. So there's sort of this extra work that they're doing in the background uh, to, to optimize the, 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 the storage when it's in their proprietary format. And that's different than what we talked about in Databricks and Spark, uh, Spark SQL and, and Dremel, where they just assume that people are going to be putting random files on S3, and they don't have the ability to go and rewrite them and modify them and reorganize them. And they just had to you know, run the query on directly as the files as they existed. Whereas in, in Snowflake, again, using their internal format, they can use the extra cycles to, to do this, to speed things up. But we'll see how they can, they, you know, they have to support external tables and things where they can't do this. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what, how, they, how they handle that. So now one thing, thing that is interesting about uh, Snowflake's uh, proprietary format is how they want to handle semi-structured data. And so they have three uh, types that are specific or unique to, to Snowflake, variant, array, and object. Variant basically means anything, like any kind of JSON hierarchy or something like that, or XML, think, think of like that. Um, array, is, is, as it sounds, it's just an array of, of, of values of, of a arbitrary length. And an object, I think, is, is equivalent to uh, the degenerative case of variant, where like it's a single level. Uh, single level hierarchy, whereas variant can go any arbitrary length uh, or depth, right? So in the case of the Dremel paper, they talked about how they were trying to process all these protobuf files that were internal to Google. Well, if it's a protobuf file, you have the schema. You know the data types of, of the data, the, the, the fields that are inside of them, so they know how to convert them into the proper binary format and doing the shredding or breaking out the separate columns as, as we talked about. In the case of Databricks and Photon, they didn't have the schema for these files. So the way they would handle that is that while the query was running, that they would do this runtime ad adaptivity where they would switch what version of a, uh, of a primitive they would use to say, oh, I know I'm processing you know, Unicode data or ASCII data or date data versus uh, you know, uh, just random numbers, right? And so they were trying to learn while they were running the query 
what the data type actually was for these different fields. What Snowflake is going to do, it's different, is that they're going to try to figure things out upon ingestion. And again, this is, this is when you use their proprietary format, you're, you're calling insert into, uh, into the to database or you're bulk loading some, some file. So as they're processing it and putting it into their, 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 their internal format, they're going to figure out what is the data type for the different fields. Right? And so they'll do things like, you know, if you identify you have a string, like you know, a year, the month, and the day, well, they would parse that and recognize, oh, this is actually in the proper date format. So then they'll convert it automatically into you know, whatever the binary date format or timestamp format is. But they're always going to maintain the original unparsed version of all of the strings uh, in your JSON file or whatever it is in case they get it wrong. Like if someone puts a poop emoji in, in there uh, and you're processing it and you've got to fall back and say, okay, this is actually not what I thought it was. Right? So again, this is interesting. This is, this is, now you start to see the, the, the difference, difference between these different systems. Uh, you know, Dremel's doing it in one way. Photon does it another way. Snowflake's going to do it upon ingestion. And you know, at a high level, they're all doing vectorized query execution upon, you know, on, on, on an object store. But the low-level details and the nuances of them are going to be slightly different. So I'm not saying that this is a good idea or a bad idea. I think it's a, it's a, for, if it's proprietary storage and you can get the data as it comes in, yes, you should definitely do this because now you don't, need, like, you don't need to redo this over and over again to figure out what the data type is while you're running the query. And so you just do this parsing uh, once, and you get all the advantages of compression and coding that we, t we talked about before. Yes? So is this related to that Dremel question, the question I asked in the Dremel lecture, which is that they were doing it because it's expensive because that's the detail, but it's performance gains mainly because of this, that they have this conversion done for this MS function stuff already? Uh, so I, I repeat, your question, your question, the Dremel one was what, that, sorry? Was that the, the, in Dremel they, they could take up uh, the storage place could be anywhere, right? That it didn't have to be in a specific format. Right? Mm -hmm. it, needed, it could be uh, from S3. And, and I yep. was like, that, that there's extra cost in Snowflake, whereas there isn't over here. And yeah. so this is the benefit? Yeah, so, so his question is, when we talk about Dremel, Dremel talked about how rather than have people put data into a, you know, a proper, proper schema form uh, where you know the exact data types and, and set all that up ahead of time when you load the data, and then that way the query runs faster. They, from an engineering and time perspective, from a human side, they were better just people to store whatever files they want. And then at runtime, the query engine will figure out what the data type is. Right. Yes. So this is the opposite. This is like you got to give the data. Actually, it's not exactly the same because like it's JSON. You can throw any JSON you want in. Right. But then they're going to figure out why you, when you load it what the data type is. So at a high level, they're achieving the same thing. They're both saying like, okay, throw whatever data you at, we'll figure it out. Snowflake's going to figure it out when it's, when it's inserted. Dremel figures it out while it's running. But again, like if it's, if, it's, if it's parquet files or whatever, random JSON files in S3, and it's not in your proprietary format, then you got to do what Dremel does or Photon does. You kind of need, you ideally, both. But if you know most of your data is not going to be inserted directly into your file format, you need to do what Dremel does. All right, so the consistent hashing stuff we mentioned before, Again, this is how they're going to use to. Fi this is how they're going to organize the system to figure out what worker nodes are, you know, quote unquote, responsible, or are the owners of a micropartition file for a table. And right, we covered consistent hashing in the in the intro class. The basic idea is that it's a, it's a ring of a bunch of nodes, and you can insert a new entry into the ring and only move the files for, from its predecessor, and not reshuffle everything as if you were just doing. Uh, sort of naive hashing. So that means that when a, when a query shows up, the catalog is going to look at, at this, this, this hash table, figure out what, file, what workers are responsible for what files, and then when it hands out the task, it tells them, okay, here's the files you need to process, and it knows which ones, uh, you know, which ones you know, can compute that data. And it knows that the likelihood that they'll have locally cached data because the, the worker knows that's responsible for some persistent file is the only one that can maintain a long-term cache of, of, that, of that data. And then you add new compute nodes, which they say their customers do all the time, uh, then you don't have to, uh, you know, you don't have to get everything, get everything all over again from S3 or pass every worker node all their files around. You can just go retrieve things uh, in a more fine-grained manner. So this part is unique to Snowflake. I think this part is clever, and this is the right way to do this if you're going to build a, you know, sort of a, a no-lap system like this. 
All right, so the query optimizer is going to be a uh, unified cascade style doing top-down optimization. Uh, if you go read, I think, in the paper you guys read, and then if you go read the documentation, they're going to re refer to the query optimizer as the compiler. As I said before, that's a remnant of like, the, the vernacular from the 1970s, because when people sort of built the first C compiler, it was taking a high-level language like C and converting it to assembly. Same idea in, in SQL, you're taking a high-level language like SQL and converting it to the machine code or the executable code of, of a database system. So for, you know, for historical reasons, uh, Oracle, sorry, Snowflake's going to call their thing a compiler. So they're not going to rely on, on, just like Dremel and, and Databricks and Photon, like they're not, they assume they're not going to have good statistics. Either because, I mean, in the paper you guys read, it was before they had external tables, but like, uh, if it's external tables, you know nothing about potentially about the files. But even if you, if it's data you insert it in your own proprietary storage, they assume that all the stats are going to be garbage uh, and can be changing and become stale over time, that they're going to have their optimizer try to operate as much as possible, make decisions as much as possible without relying on high quality statistics. So they use some of the heuristic based techniques we talked about before, like if it's a star schema, do certain things, right, versus other, other organizations of the schema. But the, the optimizer's big the big goal that it's trying to achieve in the beginning is trying to decide which micropartitions or files that it can throw away as soon as possible before it even starts running. And again, if you have some basic stats, like some zone maps that'll screw up in the catalog, you can say, well, I can look at my query plan, I can look at my, my predicates and decide these are the files that I know can never have the data that I'm actually needing, I could ever need, and therefore go ahead and, and skip it. And like the other systems we talked about, they're instead gonna rely on runtime activity to adjust their query plans as needed. And we'll look at one example of what they're doing. So if you go through and insert data into to Snowflake using their, again, the, the ends up in the proprietary format, they are going to have some basic stats, but it's going to be simple things like zone maps, right, min, max, uh, and, and ranges within, the, within each column. They're not going to maintain any histograms, and they're not going to maintain any sketches. right? And the, the data is, you only get this when you're using their, again, their in proprietary format. So they have some, again, some, some really basic information. Uh, and instead, at runtime, they're going to have triggers to decide should they adjust things uh, as needed. But one of the challenges that they're going to face is that, and this, this, is, this is a bit of a nuanced topic that only comes up if you're actually building a query optimizer, um, is that if you need to figure out what micropartitions micro you need, need to uh, skip based on the statistics that you do have, then now you've got to start reasoning about what your expressions look like to decide whether they satisfy or not the, you know, the, the whether a micropartition could potentially satisfy any data that may be used by this query. Right? So simple things like, you know, where column greater than one, two, three, four, just a single column by itself, yeah, you could use the min-max ranges in your zone maps in each, each micropartition to figure that out. But when you start doing uh, more complex expressions, like column one plus column two is greater than one, two, three, four. Well, now you got kind of need to evaluate this thing and figure out what it actually, what it actually is, right? Or if you have like a function like this, truncate the date, uh, extract the year, and see, see whether it equals 2024, if you're just looking blindly at, you know, without understanding the semantics of what this is actually doing, like, how could you actually ever reason about this? We got to go execute this, uh, this function, right? So that you, what you, because what you really want to do is be able to rewrite it into something like this. So they talk about how they have, rather than having sort of almost two separate code bases, one for like expression valuation that's used at runtime for, you know, when you run queries and expression valuation within the, the optimizer itself, they try to leverage that same code base to be able to reuse them uh, so that you always have, guaranteed you have the same semantics, except that you need to be, be mindful that you're not actually processing real data or even sampled data. You're trying to reason about what, what's actually inside of, you know, what the expression actually could possibly do. And again, this seems like, it seems like a trivial matter, but it, from an engineering perspective, it's, it's actually quite difficult because you have to deal with like, you know, the, the null semantics of, of what data actually could be, right? Like in the case of, um, I know one system, like MySQL, what they do is when they see like a nested query, in some cases, if, if it's a nested query that should, should produce a scalar, 
they'll inside of the query optimizer, they'll literally stop query optimization, go run that query, right? Like one plus one equals two. Run that query in the execution engine, get back the result, and then inject that back in the query plan. And then you don't then then you have the constant value. Um, that's an extreme case, but again, that's the, because they don't have a way to, to evaluate the expressions directly within the, at least these a few years ago, directly within the query optimizer. You can only use the execution engine within, you know, within MySQL itself. So again, to avoid having to go run some queries, go figure out how to plan this query, they have a way to, 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 to repackage the, ex, the expression uh, evaluation engine into something that can be leveraged on top of uh, uh, statistics. Again, I, I don't, again, I'm being a bit hand wave here, like, this is hard. Trust me. Um, and the cost model team can surely tell you this. Okay, so the one op adapt optimization that they're going to do uh, that I don't think is unique to Snowflake, but they, they make a big deal about it um, that's kind of cool, is to be able to do uh, aggregation push down. So after they figure out the join order uh, using some basic heuristics, uh, basic cost model estimates in in, uh, in the query optimizer. They then want to decide when is it appropriate to push down aggregations below the joins. And you want to do this when you recognize things that the, the amount of data that I, I may be processing for the join uh, can be reduced significantly if I do like a partial aggregation right below, the, uh, right below the join and then sum things up again down below. So in this case here, they could recognize that this aggregation could actually be partially computed on, the, on this side here, on the probe side of this join. And then now when I do the join, I'm just joining on the aggregation key rather than all possible keys that, 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 that are coming out of this table scan. So in this case here, I push down the table scan, aggr aggregation child, and then update the top one to aggregation parent. And you can do this for some things very easily, like if it's a min and max, you know, in that case, like, there's not, you don't worry about duplicates. But for some counts and averages, you need, need to account for that. And so the aggregation is at the top, the parent one, is, is, a, is a bit more tricky to do. And so the way they're going to do this is that they're always, under the right conditions, the query optimizer is going to inject these, uh, these special push down aggregation operators into the query plan, but they're going to be disabled by default. And then just like before when we talked about adaptive query optimization, they're going to have trigger mechanisms to say, if the amount of data coming up through me is larger than I anticipated or, or than it should be based on some cost model that, that they've generated, then it'll go ahead and just enable that aggregation uh, plan node instead of just being a pass through. Yes? Two questions. Yes. Why do we not always want to do this? This question, why do, you, why do you not always want to do this? Because the aggregation may be computing may be expensive, right? Depends on number of join key, or sorry, the, the group by keys. Okay. Right, group by key, group by key foo, or in a, in a table, or, or column one, and the, the number of sync values in column one is, is you know, is, is whatever, is equal to the number of tuples. Right. And your second question was? You answered it with that. Okay. Uh, what other database systems do this? This question, what other database systems do this? I think uh, Dremel might do this. Um, the, the blog article mentions this, so I'll talk about it in a second. Yes? How do they determine Question: How do they determine join ordering if they don't have sketches or, or, or detailed statistics? Um, again, I think it's you. You have a rough estimate of the. You have a rough, a rough estimate of the, the 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 data might be coming out of the, the. The table scans based on the number of micropartitions you can prune in these statistics. Now, how they do cost estimations on the output of the join? That I don't know. Like I said, they might. They probably do what Dremel does. Is like, oh, I recognize I have a star schema. Let me have the, all the, the dimension tables be like the, the, the build side of a hash join and write up the fact table as, as the last pipeline. Like a simple like, trick like that would be, would, would, you know, provide a huge benefit. But I don't think they're reordering the joins at runtime. I don't think anybody does that. I thought they were doing distinct value uh, estimation. At least that's what it says in the paper. It says, I think they're doing distinct value estimation, but like after the join, like, like the stats are all garbage. Um, so Snowflake loves talking about this optimization that they do, uh, and there's a blog article uh, about it um, from, from last year, and actually written by Bowei, who was my student, who took 721, probably 2016, 2017, uh, and went off and built this piece in, um, 
and Snowflake. That's pretty cool. And I think again, I think this blog article mentions that like there's a couple other systems that do this, but I don't I don't know if they name names. Okay. All right, so that's the that's the high level overview of what Snowflake does. Um, and again, the idea here is that you sort of compare and contrast some of the, the nuances that they're doing that are going to be different than, than Dremel and, and Photon and, and, and Redshift and Yellow Brick, the other, the other ones we'll, that we'll cover. Um, and I'm trying to highlight the parts that, that, I think, that I think are interesting. So I want to go back to this thing I mentioned at the end of last class uh, about how you know, Databricks came out with Photon and made a big announcement, had the Sigma paper, and then they also announced that they had uh, that they they had they had audited TBC DS numbers, and they were the fastest implementation ever. So, in addition with this, they put out a blog article, you know, announcing the paper and announcing that they have the 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 new world record in audited TBC DS. Um, and in in this uh, in this blog article, they include this graph here, where they compare uh, Databricks against Snowflake. Uh, and this is this is being run by uh, researchers at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, um, and running on a what, what's called a power set or uh, of of TBCDS. So think of like as a it's a selected subset of, of the TBC you know the hundred TBCDS queries that it meant to be you know representative of like pushing a database system really hard, right? So this blog article came out what November 2021, and then two or three weeks later the Snowflakes guys came, came out. And they start going on about how the database guys didn't run Snowflake correctly, that their, their results are all garbage, uh, and don't, don't trust what they're saying. Snowflake is actually faster and not as expensive as what Databricks is saying. Like that Databricks ran on the enterprise version of Snowflake, but because they weren't using any of the enterprise features, they could have run on the regular version of Snowflake and cut down the cost quite significantly, right? And these are the two founders, the two French guys that I, that I mentioned at the beginning, right? The two guys that came, that came from Oracle. So they came out and said, all the, all the Databricks numbers are garbage. Well, two days later, Snowflake, oh, sorry, the Databricks guys came out again, and they go, now we stand by our numbers, uh, and that the Snowflake guys are being disingenuous, and that what's really going on is that uh, these are results that Snowflake is, is publishing for their, for their data set. So like in, in the Snowflake blog article, they give you, it's like, here's how to go you know, sign up for a Snowflake account and go access the TPCDS data set and run this experiment exactly yourself to see why the database numbers are garbage. So that's what this res result is here. Um, but what, they're, uh, what the database guys are saying, though, is the, the data set, the data they're actually running on in the Snowflake results are when you use their internal proprietary storage format and when they've already run that micropartition rebalancing optimization that we talked about before. So the data has been not cooked, but prepared, because it's been ingested through the system and they've done the extra steps to, to get into a form that, that is ideal for them. And that if you just take the, the, the raw data set uh, that you're given from the TPCDS data generator and then run that without any additional preparation on Snowflake, this is the result that you're getting. And this is, the, from, this is what they reported from this, the Barcelona data center. Whereas in Databricks, if you don't do any, any preparation, this is what you get, right? So in the official TPC, TPCDS documentation, you actually have to include the preparation time of the data in your, in your, in your, uh, in your time uh, measurements. So like if you think about this, like if my query is going to run for a minute, but I spent 24 hours compressing the hell out of them and, and re-optimizing as much as possible, I have to report the 24 hours plus the one minute. And so that's what the database guys are arguing, that like this time here doesn't include whatever that preparation is. And then if you just throw raw files at it, this is actually what you get, right? So I like to be the, 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 the Switzerland, <coughs> he's coughing, I like to be the Switzerland of databases. I want to get along with everyone. Uh, so um, <laughs> when, this came, when, when this came out, this will have to cut as well. You know, I would say for, for Databricks, they, for this was a big win for them because Prior to this, certainly Spark SQL was not as sophisticated and as advanced, you know, compared to Photon and other systems at the time. Uh, but this showed them, put them in a, in a different light, you know, showed that okay, you can use Databricks as a high-performance data warehouse and put someone, you know, the same equal footing in a sort of competitive market space against uh, uh, Snowflake and other systems around at the time. 
So this was a win for, for, for Databricks, I think. 2021? This is 2021, yes, uh, during the pandemic. OK. Have they come out with any comparisons since then? His question is, have they come out with any comparisons since then? No, I don't think so. There's always been some kind of like, the, for these guys fought, then like the, the time series data these people fought over benchmarks, right? There's always some battle between these various systems. Um, uh, why is it hard to run Databricks tests? Like, why can't we just run the numbers in benchmark Databricks? This question is, why, like, why is it hard to run, rerun the Databricks ones? Yeah. I mean, like... Just put the TPCDS uh, uh, data there and just run it. So yeah, so like, if, if, it's, if it's raw files on Parquet, and again, if, yeah. if, you, if you say zero preparation, that would be an apple to apples comparison, right? But here's where things get weird. Like, not weird, but like, it's a well-known fact that over the years, the various data vendors have various optimization tricks that are specific to the TPC benchmarks. So if you recognize, yeah, it's a well-known thing. Recognize that, oh, in TPCC, this is a very common thing. Oh, you're accessing a new, the new orders table or the warehouse table? I know what benchmark you're running. And they'll do, like, they'll, they'll give you certain query plans or do certain optimizations that you would not normally get. Right? <laughs> oh, he's like, he said like the Volkswagen one. It's, it's not that bad because like, like, that was polluting the environment. That's, that's worse. Uh, this, is, this is more like the speed test. When you speed test your internet. Yeah, like if, if yes. <laughs> Actually, no, there you go. It is the Volkswagen one. That's, that's, other than like polluting, like, yeah, like Volkswagen, their cars would recognize, oh, I know I'm running the emissions test. So it ran at a more optimized manner. But then when it was out in the real world, it was polluting a lot more. Um, like there's tricks you can do in TPCC. I, I don't know all the tricks or the, the analytical workloads. In TPCC, for example, like the, you know, you call create index on the warehouse table, but like there's only 100 warehouses, so you don't need a full fledged B plus tree. Just do a sorted sorted uh, sorted array. And that's gonna be way faster than the, because because the number of warehouses don't increase when you run that benchmark. So you, so you make a static array and do really fast lookups, right? But like if, you, if anybody else would not get that optimization. So there's there's well known tricks like this. Um, okay, so let's finish up. Um, this we talked about, uh, I mentioned it many times. Again, Snowflake started off as being proprietary storage. The world of, the, of, of, of data lakes ha has, has evolved or has expanded. And so over the years, they've added support for accessing data that's not directly in their proprietary format. It first started off with this thing called Snowpipe, which basically was a Kafka endpoint that allowed you ingest data that in, in, in Apache era format, that then actually did, got writ, did get written to their proprietary format. But in 2021, they added external tables. I actually don't know what this actually wor looks like because the documentation say, oh, it's this data format or whatever. I, so I don't actually know what they're doing other than I know they can read from the Hive uh, metadata catalog. But then to read Parquet files, they've added uh, support for Iceberg in 2022, which we talked about last class. It's basically Parquet files with additional metadata to keep track of uh, the schema information and, and you can do uh, you know, simple updates and insert update deletes on, on the, those, those files. And then in 2022, they also announced support for, uh, for what, they, what they call hybrid tables. And this is a service that I think is still called Unistore. And it's basically a full-fledged transaction, transactional database system uh, as, that's a row store. And it's running inside the Snowflake ecosystem that you can do you know, queries, SQL queries on and run TPCC and other transactional workloads. And what will happen is, the data will get inserted in a log structured format as a row, and then in the background they'll then uh, run compaction and convert it to uh, columnar data stored in the uh, in the Snowflake proprietary format, right? And so when you now run an OLAP query, it's basically the fractured mirrors approach, uh, where query shows up, you have a table that's being declared as a hybrid table, and the the execution engine has to recognize, oh, some of the data I can get get from the column store side. But I also need to merge with some data that I have on, on the row store side. And it provides a, a single viewpoint for all of this. So again, this is in response to like Delta Lake. Actually, I think they support Delta Lake now as well. Uh, but the idea of like, again, ingesting data from, from different sources, if you know, it's one additional thing, a way to access, put data into Snowflake, you can now run your transactional application on, on top of this. So Snowflake is a great OLAP system. Uh, how can they build a transactional system that, again, that's just as equally as hard, that, that's fault tolerant, reliable, and safe. How can they build a transactional database system at the same time? Well, 
uh, let's just say you have a transactional data system you're already using uh, for other things that you can then start using it for other, uh, other parts, parts in your system. So famously, Snowflake runs their catalog on this thing called FoundationDB. Who here has heard of FoundationDB before for this class? Three, four, five, right, small. Basically, in the NoSQL days, in the early 2010s, uh, there was all these NoSQL systems that were doing key value stores that didn't do any transactions. And, and FoundationDB said, well, we're going to be a transactional key value store. Um, and I think they were backed also by Sutter Hill. And so basically, they got the two boy bands to put out, you know, to work together. And Snowflake decided to use FoundationDB early on as their, their catalog. It's one less thing they, they'd have to build because you, you, you need a transactional catalog. So the challenge, though, is that FoundationDB got bought by, by, by Apple in 2015. And, and it, it was always closed source. So what happens is Snowflake had in their contract with FoundationDB that if they get acquired to go under, they get the source code uh, in the escrow service. They would get access to the source code. Because again, by this point, 2015, Snowflake was huge. It was you know, not as big as it is now, but it was, it was growing quite rapidly. So you know, Apple buying their, the main thing that runs you know, your entire catalog service would be a huge problem. So they got access to the source code, um, and they kept maintaining that and, and over the years. And then when Apple then opened source foundation DB, they then had to spend time to get it merged back together and, and follow the, the open source version. And now, right now, the number one contributor to FoundationDB, I think, is Apple. The number two is, is Snowflake. But for legal reasons, the Snowflake people can't commit code directly into FoundationDB. Only Apple employees have to, can do that. But they literally show me, like on Slack, they say, hey, commit this to the Apple people. <laughs> and, and the people, then they, they'll do it for them. Right? I don't know whether that's changed. That, that's what it was a few years ago. Um, FoundationDB, we don't have time to cover this. It's a very fascinating system. Their testing infrastructure was insane. Uh, they, it was, they, they had this basically deterministic testing infrastructure where they could introduce faults on like the disk, the network, and whatever, and show that thing was, was, could, fault, was could fail over and was fault tolerant. Um, they, uh, the guys that built FinHDB have, have a new startup called Antithesis, where they're now they're trying to sell the infrastructure that they built for FinHDB to do testing for distributed databases. How do you make key value store transactional in the sense that they could, isn't it like LSM based? His question is, how do you make a key value store transactional? Is it not LSM-based? Uh, it doesn't matter. Your your statement is, how do I make a key value store transactional? But like, I'm assuming that they, they probably use MVCC, right, to make it, uh, to handle the intern transactions. Uh, I had to go look. I don't remember. But like, the fact that like it's a key value store versus a relational database, it doesn't not, does not matter. Begin, put, 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 commit. It's all the same. Right? That's basically what InnoDB is doing underneath the covers. Right? InnoDB is a key value interface on a B plus tree. MySQL does the higher level stuff, but like, it's doing transactions and all that. WireTiger, RocksDB, it's all the same. It doesn't matter whether it's key value store or not. OK, all right. So uh, this is, again, a crash course on what Snowflake is. Again, I, I think it's a very fascinating system. And even though, again, it's 12 years old now, uh, I still consider it to be a very much state of the art. Now, the yellow brick guys are going to go way o overboard with some of the optimizations that they're going to do. Uh, we'll see that next week. Um, but again, like, in terms of like a, a disaggregated storage lake house system that does vectorized query execution, right? what Snowflake provides or did back then is, is common now, but it's still uh, uh, state of the art. Although you can see sort of not cracks in it, but you can sort of see how there's aspects of it that are sort of remnants of being designed 12 years ago, whereas like you know, again, whether or not they're still running on EC2 images, I don't know. But this adding support for external tables after you've already had this proprietary storage, that's not how you would build a, a, a system today um, if you want to do uh, lake, lake houses or data lakes. But again, it's still, I still think it's, a, you know, it's, it's still a very fast, very good system. The other challenge, I guess, from, from a Snowflake perspective, like you look at Velox, look at Data Fusion, the core, you know, the core engine itself has become commoditized. So it's all the stuff up above that Snowflake does, the snow park, the snow pipe stuff, all that is what separates them from their, their competitors because that's the user experience, right? And the ad adaptivity at runtime that you know, is going to matter rather than just like how fast can you do your vectorized scan. All right, so next class on Wednesday, we're going to read the DuckDB paper. It's, I think the paper I read, had you guys sign is like, it's the demo paper, so it's like, it's two pages, it's, it's two pages or four? Well, it's two, three pages. Okay, yeah, so there isn't a canonical DuckDB paper uh, out there. That's the best we can do. Um, well, we'll cover the Mother Duck paper that came out uh, 
uh, this year, but I don't think that one discusses the core architecture. But I'll go through, like, hear what DuckDB, like, the internals actually look like. Um, and that's based on public talks and other documentation that, that they, they've given. And this is going to be slightly different than everything we talked about before, because like, we're making a big deal about these OLAP systems that are running on lake houses. And now we're talking about an embedded, in-process database system. But again, it, we'll see how they can read data from S3 and other things as well. OK? All right, guys. See ya. Got a bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't ain't no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cross, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can chill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the paint is red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. They go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the chili cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Isles.